Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, apparently there's a bit of an uh, intermittent problem with, uh, uh, with the beamer, but, but there's nothing I can do about that. So sometimes the picture goes away, but it tends to pop back up. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about testing small projects and medium-sized projects with uh, BHAT. Um, uh, my name is Peter Franse. Uh, I'm from Belgium, but I'm now located in Bulgaria. Uh, on Drupal.org, I'm known with my short name, P. Fransen. Um, you can find me on Drupal.org, and also uh, I use the same name on Twitter. And if you want, I just posted the slides uh, on my Twitter account. So if you want to refer to them later on, uh, you will be finding them there. Uh, I work for AUSI. Um, it's an outsourcing company in Belgium. They have a stand here um, if you're maybe looking for work in Belgium or Brussels or for nice projects, then pay them a visit. All right, so testing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in the beginning about testing in general and how you can apply it uh, in your daily work. Um, so I have this little infographic that I found on the internet, and it nicely highlights like four different ways that uh, teams tend to use testing in their daily work. So the first type of testing you can do is to automatically run a full test suite on all supported platforms after every push in Git. Another way to do it is that you have a QA engineer who tests uh, the new features and then also clicks through the website to see if there are any regressions and if the, yeah, if the existing functionality is still okay. Or you can have like developers testing the new features on their own machines, and then when everything's fine, you deploy it to production. Or finally, which is like called the holy grail of testing, it's like you don't do any testing and just rely on the client to report bugs. So maybe can uh, are there any people here that uh, like have an automatic test suite running on their systems? All right, very very nice. Do you, there are there people that have like a QA engineer in their company that is like? Uh, responsible for the testing, great. And then who does testing on their own before they deploy to production? All right, and is there anybody who doesn't do any testing? Yeah, okay, very brave. You have a very good client relationship, I guess. Yeah, good. All right, so why would we want to do testing? There are a few goals. Uh, first of all, we want to prove uh, to our uh, client that the requirements they have for the projects are being met. So the client asks for certain functionality, uh, we implement them, and by testing the functionality, we can actually prove like, okay, this is actually working. Also, you want to prove that all the input to your code is being handled correctly. Like the, the big uh, example is like a SQL injection. If you have certain bad data being input to your uh, application, you want to be, be sure that nothing bad happens. And also, a nice goal of testing is to actually find bugs. It's like unknown bugs. When you start testing your own application, you suddenly find some bugs that were there, and you can log them and fix them. And the, the, for me, the biggest part is by testing, you can prevent um, regressions from occurring. A regression is, in the eyes of our clients, one of the worst things uh, that can happen. It can really sour uh, the relationship we have. It's like, yeah, we develop like a, a, a newsroom, uh, we deploy it on the server, everything's fine. Three weeks later, there is a bug. It's like the newsroom's not working anymore, uh, the client reports it, there's a fatal error or something, we fix it. But then two weeks later, it's broken again. And then it very often happens that the reason for this page not working anymore is not the same reason as before. There might be some other part of the code that was responsible. But in the eyes of our client, it looks like, hmm, they made a mistake and they made the same mistake again. Do these people actually know what they're doing? You know? And if you actually use testing in an automated way, you can test everything you've built before and day after day, prove that it's still, it's still working. So in this way, you can actually prevent uh, regressions from occurring. Now, why would we not only test stuff manually, but automate it? First of all, it's a lot faster. Like, if you have a machine clicking through your website and filling in forms, they can do it at, like, a rate of uh, 
a few pages per second, and a, a, a manual tester can never uh, handle such a throughput. Also, it's more reliable. Like uh, people testing stuff, it's like even if you have a script, you can forget stuff or you can be uh, time pressured. Like in these, if you have a machine doing it, they will be very strict. Okay, this is the stuff we need to test. They will do it in the same way again and again, a hundred times, a thousand times. They will never get tired. Also, it's better uh, for your coverage because, like, if you're handling input, it's easy in an automated test to check, like, okay, we're going to test creating 100 nodes in our overview. You can do it, like, asking a human tester to write 100 articles. I mean, it's, it's like almost an impossible task, but having a machine do it, they, they will take a few minutes or something, and they will just crunch through it, it will be fine. And also, it's very reusable. You write a test once, and it's very cheap. Just run it. Run it again and again. Just run a command. The machine will run the test for you. And everything's perfect. Now, there are a lot of types of automated tests. Um, one of the most important ones is called functional testing. In functional testing, you're actually testing the end user functionality of the website. So you're not testing code. You're testing like you're simulating a user, or you actually are, maybe if you're doing a functional test as a human tester, you're trying out the functionality of the website, so you're actually using the product. Um, there are also unit tests that you can do. A unit test, uh, most of you will be probably familiar with it. It's an uh, object-oriented uh, way of testing. It's like you have a piece of code, a class, it has a number of functions or methods in it, and you will test the functionality of every little component on its own. And it's typically a very fast way of, of running tests. It's like you can uh, try like a thousand inputs to it and it will run that in a few milliseconds. Um, you can do like stress testing, load testing, performance testing. This will be typically on a, on a live website or on an um, uh, um, uh, acceptance environment. You will just like try out what happens to simulate if like what happens if a thousand visitors come to our website at the same time. Um, is it able to handle that? Is our caching uh, able to deal with this? Um, you can have regression tests, really important as I said. Like you had a bug, client reports a bug, you fix the bug, write a test that checks that this particular bug has been fixed and um, you can automatically try that again and again. Then there are like very specific tests which they call a smoke uh, and a sanity test. This is maybe not so familiar. This is a very quick running basic test that you can do when you do like an automated deployment to a production environment. It will like very briefly go through the most important parts of your website and check that everything's fine. Like it, pay a visit to the home page, see that there are no fatal errors there. Try to log in on the, on the login page. That's fine, maybe like go to your checkout if you have a, um, uh, an e-shop. Like really quickly, it takes five seconds or something. If this works fine, okay, we're gonna deploy to production. If anything goes wrong, if the homepage doesn't load, okay, we're gonna roll back and we're not gonna deploy it today. And then the final one I want to mention is uh, A-B tests. Also very specific use case, it's very often used in marketing. It's like you have two versions of, uh, two variants of, uh, a thing like an advertisement or something and you serve 50% to one segment of users and then the other version to the other uh, segment of users and then you compare how well it works. You can also use it for like usability testing. Yeah, like you have a new uh, call to action button or something and then you can find out, okay, do people actually have a, an easier way of finding this and using it? All right. And there are also some kind of tests that are not automatable at all. So they can only be performed by humans. One of them is acceptance testing. So like uh, when you use Agile, you're developing stuff for a client. The client or the product owner will want to go through the functionality manually and actually verify before they say, okay, this meets my expectations and you can merge it into the main product. Second one, alpha beta testing. I guess everybody knows what this is. You have a pre-production version of the product just announce it to the world. Please, people, test this, report any problems you find. I mean, this, you cannot have a machine do this. You really need human attention here. And then the final one is like usability testing and accessibility testing. 
Is my product easy to use? Is it accessible to people with disabilities? Um, you cannot have a machine try this. That's um, a human task. Then, I want to talk to you a little bit about the business value of having tests. So, I want to talk about like why would you like to have tests for like a small client or a medium-sized uh, project? Because most of the time, um, I hear from people like, okay, we have this small project. We only have a limited amount of time to build it. We have a limited budget. But we see the value in testing. It would be good to have this. But how can we like convince our client that this is actually worth the time that we invest into it? Because, of course, it takes some time. You gain also time because you will have fewer technical depth. You will have fewer regressions. So in the long term, I mean, for a, a big project, it's easy to justify it. But for a smaller project, it's like, okay, maybe we're only working on this project for three months. We don't have like the really long-term benefit of having a, a big automated test suite. But anyway, it's so it does reduce the QA effort. If you have uh, QA engineers, even if your uh, project only runs for a few months, they will, they will have an increased log of tests to do every day. Um, so have, have, being able to automate this will just save time on QA every day uh, for as long as the project runs. You minimize regressions. Even in a short, in a, in a, in a small project, you will deal with regressions, and you can avoid many of them. It increases the stability of the product. By having some tests, you, are like, you can have full confidence that by the time you're ready to deploy, this, everything is working, you know? It's like, in this, in this time, you will have run tests a thousand times, and it's like, yeah, we've passed this a thousand times. It's really stable, it's really working. Um, it also improves the quality of the software. Because by doing tests, you will find more bugs, you will have them fixed, you will be aware of them, and the, the quality of the product will uh, increase. Um, the delivery process will also be streamlined. It's like if your client finds uh, a problem or they have a, a really urgent new feature, the time to market between like, getting the, the request from the client and actually deploying it to production can be a lot shorter because all of this testing is automated. It's like you can develop it, run the test, see, okay, nothing breaks, we're good, deploy to production. It can go really, really quickly. And also, and this is, I think, one of the most important points, if you are using Agile, who is not using Agile? Everybody's using Agile. If you're using Agile, you're actually required to use automated testing. It's a key component of Agile. You actually you have to uh, test stuff, Iterate over the test. That's the cycle we do in Agile. So if your client wants to use Agile, I mean, you have to use testing. All right, so Agile, let's talk a little bit about that. And in our daily works, uh, we will have a ticket. How will we deal with this stuff? So we are all building websites. Very typically, uh, by the time we get a feature from our client until it gets to production, there are four tasks that need to be done. First of all, we will make wireframes um, or mockups or whatever you call them. So the client has a, maybe an email or they made a ticket in Jira or something. We will make a wireframe that will serve as a guide uh, for the development team and the designers to know where things will be placed on the page, how it will look roughly. Um, this wireframe gets built first. Once it is, it is done, we can have two teams or two people starting working in parallel. So the designer can start to design the wireframe, make it look really nice, and the backend team can begin developing the functionality that's described, uh, described in the wireframe. When those two are done, then the final step can take place. The front-end development can happen, because for the front-end to be done, you need to have the design and you need to have uh, the backend functionality built. And once this is done, you're ready to deploy to production. Now, when we use testing, how does it come into place? Actually, at each of these steps, you can do a quality assurance step and a user acceptance step. Is everybody familiar with, with these terms? It's like key agile um, terminology. So you will, somebody will make the wireframes. The QA will be done by somebody of the technical team to have a look at like if this is actually practical to develop this in Drupal. Uh, are there any like technical reasons to make maybe do it differently? 
then UAT will be the client or the product owner having a look, okay, this wireframe matches what I want, go ahead. Then the same thing will happen on the design part. So the design is being built, a technical analysis will be done, like can we actually translate this into uh, HTML and CSS? Um, client will look again, they will have like a lot of remarks about the design, the blue needs to be a little bit different. And then on the backend development, um, another a, a colleague, like somebody will develop the feature, another person will have a look at the code. Like, is this good? Um, is the code well written? Are there any security vulnerabilities? And also, the QA engineer will look at the tests that were written for this feature and see, is this test comprehensive? Does it match? Is it good? Is it some part maybe omitted or something? And then when this is done, okay, we will have another UAT step. The client will check it. Does it work correctly? And then we go to the front-end development, and actually the same thing will happen there, especially if you develop some JavaScript on the front-end. Somebody will need to look at the code, and the client will need to approve it again. All right. Um, and then I guess also everybody's using Git, hopefully. Anybody not using version controller Git? Okay, so in Git it will maybe look a bit like this. So you will have a master branch, which is not on the slide. The master branch shows the actual state of the product in production. Then there is a develop branch, which contains the code which is going to be uh, deployed on production in the future. And then we have a feature branch. This feature branch is actually will be the number one, two, three, four. It's like, you, and like if you use Jira or similar software, you can have like a, a main ticket with sub uh, tickets. And you can give like the feature is all four development steps together. And then each of these uh, steps that need code written will have a separate branch. So there will be a backend branch, which will be in this case number one, two, three, seven. And then the front end branch will be one, two, three, eight, right? So you branch off from the, the feature branch, start developing. Once it's done and it has gone through QA and UAT, then you know, okay, the backend development has been done, it's good, it has been looked at, it's tested, client has approved it. At this point, you merge it back into the main ticket. This means that the main ticket contains approved code. If it gets rejected, you stay in the backend ticket and keep working there. And then you do the same for the front end. So work on it, iterate over it until it's ready, go through QA and everything. Then you merge it back into the feature branch, have the client have a final look, and only when it's done, you merge it into the develop branch. So this means that the develop branch at any point in time will contain working code which has been approved by the client, it has been looked at and they are fine with it. And this is really good because at any point in time you can receive a phone call from your client and says like, hey, we have a, an emergency, we need to have a bug fix deployed today. And you can just deploy your develop branch in full confidence because the stuff is tested and ready. So you should at no point ever get anything in develop which is uh, not ready for prime time. Does this, does, this, does this make sense to everybody? All right. Good. A few tips. So create subtasks if you use Jira or, I mean, every uh, project management software has a similar way of, of grouping these tasks together. Um, work in separate branches. Uh, do QA and UAT for everything that's important. And only merge when it's done, meaning when your tests are green. Okay, if maybe if you don't know, a green test is a good test, a test that passes, that works, right? And then the end result is your product is always shippable. It's like you could at any point in time push the button and deploy to production because your development will, uh, develop branch will be good. Okay, now in Agile, we have this uh, concept of the definition of done. Um, I don't know if all teams use this uh, very strictly, but most of the time, like, you need to have some kind of a rule to say when you are done with development. And I think a good way of doing this is, is using this list. So when is our ticket done? It's done when the implementation is complete, so we actually build what the client wants. When the documentation is complete, we, we wrote some documentation explaining how this feature can be used. 
for the future. You never know if you get a new one person on the team. Uh, tests are added. Uh, the tests are also passing. If there is any test not passing, this means you introduced a bug somewhere, a regression. And uh, I mean, you should never get anything through it. It's not done. If your tests are failing, the ticket is not done. Um, then also provide manual test instructions in a ticket. And I'll get back to this later. But it's really nice because your ticket will go on to a QA engineer and a UAT uh, engineer. If they have step-by-step -step instructions that explains exactly like, look, I log in as an administrator and I go to this page and I press this button and then this will happen because very often in a ticket, it's, the functionality is described well, but you're not completely sure oh, which URL do I have to go to. Oh, I actually have to see an error message on the, what, what are the exact words that are being used in this error message? I mean, if you provide these step-by-step -step instructions, people can just follow them read through them, and they have instant knowledge of the functionality that has been built. Also, if there is any technical depth being introduced in the ticket, if you know that you put a workaround in there because you didn't have time to fix something properly, there might be a bug in Drupal Core or in a module, something happened and you can fix it later, put it to do as a little comment in the code, saying, okay, I acknowledge there is a little bit of technical depth here, Make a ticket in Jira or in your software and put the ticket number at the line of code that you put there so that you keep track of your technical debt. This is something like, ah, yeah, you, at the moment in time when you do, when you create this workaround, you're very aware of it. Three weeks later, you forget about it and there is this bug left and it will be forgotten for everybody. So it's nice to have this in the definition of done so that you know like, okay, I need to do this before I can move the ticket on. Now, when it gets to the QA, the first thing you should do is actually check <laughs> that the defin definition of done has been met. So are there tests? Is the functionality complete? Are these step-by-step step -step instructions there? I mean, come on, do I really need to go through this Jira ticket and 50 comments to know what's being developed here? Please give me the step-by-step -step instructions. It's not there, I reject it. Uh, you should do a code review. Just review all the code, have a look for security vulnerabilities, is it well written, can it be optimized maybe. Uh, and then also have a look if the test coverage which, which was built by your colleague is, is enough. It's like, you don't have to be incredibly strict, by the way. I'm not telling you if you build a, a website for a, a small um, project, that you have to test every single feature in detail. I mean, there's, there's stuff that's really important for the client, but if there is like a certain link in the footer, I mean, you don't need to test the really obvious and minor stuff. But you just assess it, you know, it's good to have a second person have a look at what has been built and just have like an idea, ah, maybe, you know, you test that if we use facet filters on the, on the search page that it works, but you don't test what happens if you turn it off again because everything should appear, you forgot this step. So that's a very good thing to do. All right, now uh, another part. So we're done with, um, with the agile stuff. Um, I think that even if you have a small project, you should aim to get continuous integration working uh, for your team. I think personally, continuous integration is critical for success of a, pro a project. You need to be automated, uh, this stuff. Like the first time you do this, this will take time. But if you already have experience with continuous integration, like the next project to use in continuous integration will be really quickly to set up. Does everybody know what continuous integration is about? Do you need to explain this? Okay, so what's really good is that you make a change and you push your code to a branch that the tests will start running automatically. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to start them manually. You don't have to depend on some person to uh, like install the website on a machine and run the test. No, it should be fully automatic. And also you can deploy acceptance environments automatically. Um, often like a client will want to test new stuff before it goes live. And it's really good that this happens automatically. I mean, you can go like uh, use a service like Amazon, deploy a testing instruction, send an email to the client and says like, yeah, the new feature you asked for is ready for testing on the server. Please go to this address, log in there and you will find um, this ticket. 
there. And please give your uh, remarks. And there are many ways of doing this. I mean, every uh, organization has their own preferred way of doing continuous integration. So we can use um, uh, software as a service um, uh, providers like Travis CI is a famous one. There's continuous PHP. You can use your in-house uh, Jenkins um, installation. That's also very powerful. So there are ways to do this, but please, if you don't use continuous integration today, talk to your bosses and say like, can we get this please? Because it will, it will make everything go really, really smoothly. You will get feedback of uh, the stuff that's happening immediately. Now, okay, so we have a small project. What, what are we gonna test? What's important is, so you test, yeah, you test the important functionality. Don't, don't try to be, you don't want to waste hours of time testing nonsense. Um, what's also important, really test every single regression that you get. If your client reports a bug, if your ticket has the word bug in it, test the bug so that your client will never see the same bug twice because they will lose confidence in your uh, abilities. I also think that the test should be easy to write. Some tests can be really complex to write. If you're writing like a unit test uh, with dependency injection and mocking and stuff, this can take a lot of time. So go for the ones that are easy to write. Also, the test results should be pretty quick. If you have to wait hours for your test suite to uh, give feedback to you, I mean, you don't have time for this if you're building a small project. You might have only three people on the team or something. You, you don't want to wait like hours for, uh, to move on with the project. <clears throat> it should be cheap to implement on run. Just a second. Ah, because our small projects don't have a lot of budget. So we, we don't want like a, a data center in the, in the basement and people managing it. I mean, the, the greatest thing is that you have like a service like Travis CI, you pay them 100 euro per month and you can run all the tests on them. That, that's the ideal situation. And as I said, they should run automatically. No human involvement needed. Um, and then, yeah, so and I'll, as I'll show you, the, the great way of doing this is BHAT. So we haven't talked about BHAT yet. A little bit of history. How, how did we get to testing in Drupal? This will be very brief. Um, from Drupal 4 on, there was a simple test module which was originally a contrib module. It was not part of core. Um, so really early on, people started to realize, like, look, if we're building a, a CMS and we want it to be stable, we really need to have testing in it. Um, when they started with the Drupal 7 development cycle, so this is like years before Drupal 7.0 actually got released, they said, okay, we're going to move the simple test framework into core and from this moment on, every single feature and every single bug fix in Drupal core will have a test. And this has been an enormous success. This is the reason why Drupal today is so incredibly stable. I mean, I've been using Drupal 8 since 8.0 and it has only been stable for me. It's, it's there are no, uh, okay, we have bugs, but it's not like there are no weird things happening. If it works once, it will keep working. In Drupal 8, um, they revamped the whole testing infrastructure. We are now using PHP unit, which is like the standardized PHP uh, testing library. Um, and we have four ways of testing stuff in Drupal 8. One is the browser test base, this is functional testing. We have a kernel test base, which is intended to test like integration between modules or services in Drupal 8. There's actually, it's quite a smart system. It will install an empty Drupal site in the memory, so it doesn't use a disk for this. And then it will enable you to say like, okay, I'm gonna test like a node and I'm going to just enable the database schemas of the node module and then run a really quick test on uh, this really small Drupal instance. And then we have the unit test case, which is the, the classic unit testing to test actual uh, code in uh, classes. And then the newest one, uh, it has been added in Drupal 8.1, is a JavaScript test base. So actually, finally, for the first time in years, we have a way in core to test um, JavaScript code. And then there are third-party uh, testing frameworks. So there is BHAT, Codeception, and Atum. And I want to talk a little bit about BHAT. Now, to make a comparison, um, uh, so if you use browser test, this stuff is, so they, this is functional testing. 
So you test the functionality of the website, but the problem is it's quite slow. The reason it's so slow is that for every test, it will reinstall Drupal from scratch, do a full installation of Drupal. So if you have like a, a website that has like 50 modules or something, this can take some time. It can take like a, a minute or two just for a single test just to get started. If you start to have like 100 tests, this will become very slow. Then there is PHP unit. This is unit testing, so you're not testing the functionality, you're testing the actual code that you've written. And this means that it's very, very fast. You don't need to install anything, it's just like purely testing lines of code here. But on the other hand, it's very, very difficult to write. It's not suitable for a small project because you need to mock any dependency that your code might have and this will result you in like half of your development time will be spent on writing tests. And this is the actual reason why many people think that testing for a small project is impossible because I have experience with unit testing and they know like, okay, it takes time to write these tests, it takes a lot of time to maintain these tests. And actually, yeah, this is really, we don't have the budget for this. But then there is the third uh, solution, it's like BHAT. This is functional testing, you're testing the end user functionality. It runs really fast because it doesn't reinstall Drupal. It uses, you install Drupal once at the start of the test suite, then it will run all the tests. At the end of every test, it will clean up the data that has been written. You might create 10 nodes during a test. At the end, the 10 nodes are deleted again. This is good enough. I mean, this is the, the thing that your website does anyway. So you clean up the nodes, then you start the next one. It's a lot faster than installing from scratch. And also, these tests are incredibly easy to write. So, what's the solution? We use BHAT. The BHAT Drupal extension, this is actually a plugin for BHAT. This exposes our Drupal um, CMS and integrates it with BHAT. We use a third party um, uh, code hosting solution like GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. GitLab you can host yourself as well, it's uh, open source. And use a third party CI service. So don't maintain your own infrastructure because you will need to have somebody uh, taking care of it. So you have to actually pay uh, an engineer full time to handle this. It might seem in the beginning that you don't need to, but this, if you start using Jenkins, then you will have to in the end. And this will cost you, your company, about 80 to 150 euro per month. This, like, fixing a single regression for a client will cost you a lot more than this. So this is, this is about the um, price that you're looking at. So we're getting finally to uh, the meat of the thing that you were maybe waiting for. So BHAT, what's BHAT? So BHAT is actually, it's not a, really about testing, it's, uh, it's about behavior-driven development. And um, what's behavior-driven development? Behavior-driven development is actually a way of uh, facilitating the discussions between the client and the development team. Um, and that made, might sound really vague, and we're all using it for testing in the end anyway, but so. What are we doing in behavior-driven development? Behavior, it's like a, a sub-branch of test-driven development. You know, it's like you define a language which is shared between the development team and the client. So the like a very typical example is the development team might talk about a feature and they're thinking about the features module while your client talks about the feature and they might think about a certain piece of the website that's in their mind called a feature. And like the, tech, the, the developers can always have really technical terms for things, the clients will have certain other terms, but we will follow the client's language. If the client talks about something, they call it the newsroom, we will not call it the news view, yeah, we will also call it the newsroom, so we will, have, we will develop the shared language. And this language is understandable by the client and by the development team. And this language is completely focused on the business value, so we will describe what the client wants in their project. You will, you will see it in the examples later. Now, behavior-driven development also tries to solve uh, the, the planning of the, the, the feature development. Um, and yeah, the, the, they do it by being based on the agile workflow. I mean, this works really, really well for everybody. And it's similar to user stories. So BHAT, behavior-driven development, uses the same type of uh, 
describing problems as the client is already doing in user stories and agile. So these tests look like user stories. They're very familiar. And also, uh, BDD provides the definition of ready and the definition of done. We already covered the definition of done, but it will also uh, provide the definition of ready because we will have this user story and this user story will be written in a, in a structured way and if we have this, then we know what we have to build because it will describe I'm logged in as an administrator and I go on this page, I click this button and I will get a new news article. All right, also uh, the third and what I think is also very interesting is that this BHAT um, uh, these BIAT scenarios will serve as documentation for the functionality that you have written. So you don't have to take care of this anyway anymore because you will write the actions of the user down in a little script. You do uh, certain actions on the, on the web pages after. The, and what's really nice is that, okay, you will have the full functionality of the website will be described in this text and it will be completely up to date all the time. Because if something changes, the client has a change request, there will be like this test that's failing because it's testing the old functionality. So you have to update it. You have to make, make, keep it up to date. This means your documentation will never be outdated. It will always be current. And this is also a really good basis for writing user manuals. So if at some point you have a technical writer in the team that will provide the actual end user documentation with nice screenshots and everything, they can simply follow these step-by-step -step instructions and try it out really easily. Oh, oh, it works like this. And then they can take their screenshots and write a nice text about it. And the client will be really happy. Now, the way that this works is by a specific language called Gherkin. Now it's, I think, the, one of the most inventive names for a language uh, ever. This comes actually from the original uh, behavior-driven development framework it was written for Ruby, and it was called Cucumber. When it was initially released, it was quite a stir in the web development world because, yeah, we had suddenly had this new wave of testing stuff uh, that's really straightforward. And so BIAD is actually the PHP implementation of Gherkin. This is an example of how a test looks. And Gherkin or BHAT. So we have our user story at the top. We, are, we have a new feature, so we give it a name. The feature is product highlights. Then we have our user story. In order to promote specific products, as a marketing manager, I need to highlight products on the home page. And then we have a scenario. This is, will be also our test. Also, we give it a title. The title is view product highlights. Given I have three product highlights, when I visit the front page, then I should see three highlighted products. Okay, this might sound really stupid, but this is already testing something nice. Like we have three product highlights in the database. They should be on the front page. So when I go to the front page, I see them there. Now, this is a structured way of uh, describing this test. And this is basically what Ger this is a whole definition of Gherkin in a nutshell. So we have a feature with a title. Then we have in order to. Uh, achieve a certain business objective as a user role or persona, I need to perform some action. And it's also quite important, I think, that these user roles and personas, that you, when you write these things, you think of like a person in the organization of your client that you're writing this feature for. Because I very often see people writing like, as a user of the website, I should be able to see product highlights on the home page. But in reality, the user of your website doesn't care if there are product highlights on the, on the home page. The person that really cares is like this person that's sitting in the meeting and it's the marketing manager. It's like they want to have the product highlights on the home page. And if you use the right person for describing this, you already like you're improving the relationship with your client. You know, it's like I'm building this for this person. And then the scenario themselves, so the test scenarios themselves, they start with one of five keywords. Every line starts with either given, given a certain precondition exists on the website, like given we have some data in the database, when, as a user, I perform a certain action, and I perform some other action, then something has happened which I can check. So it's a testable outcome. But something else should not have happened. I should not have any error messages on the page or something like that. 
And these five keywords actually in BHAT are completely interchangeable. So they're, they're just checked if any of those five are there and they're not doing anything differently. That's a quite interesting uh, implementation detail. Um, now, luckily, we don't have to write everything if we, have, uh, if we want to test multiple data. Oh, no, that's the next slide, actually. Okay, this is a, a bit of a, a more interesting example. Um, so we can run a scenario multiple times with different data. And this is called a scenario outline in, uh, in BHAT. And the scenario outline is indicated by this word examples, which is listed at the end of the scenario. So we have a scenario, and then we have examples, and then we have like a table, which is written with these pipes. And then the table has a header um, uh, columns, which are re uh, replicated in the test, see? So if I write, uh, read this out now, so we have a scenario that shows the number of likes, so we're implementing Facebook here. So given I am logged in as a user, when I visit the profile of one of my friends and I click on like, then I should see a certain number of likes. So the first time we run this test, I log in as Cindy. I visit the profile of Cindy, my own profile. I click on like and I should see zero likes because I cannot like my own profile. But when I log in as Thomas and I visit the profile of Cindy and I click on like, then I have one le legitimate like on the profile. Then the third time I log in as Thomas again, I visit the profile of Cindy again, and I click on like again, I will still have only one like, because I'm not actually allowed to like a person more than once. The third time, we will uh, log in as a different user, uh, Roger, and we will go to the profile of Cindy, and then there will be two likes. And then the, third, and the last one is like, okay, Roger will be visiting the profile of Thomas, and then he should also have one like. So we have a very short and simple test it tests the functionality, and it actually t can test maybe 100 line of, uh, lines of backend code already. So this doesn't cost you a lot of time to think of, or to implement, or to run. It is just very straightforward, very cheap, very good example. Um, also, um, uh, BIAT has a um, concept of tables. This looks very similar to the previous one, but we don't have the word example there. This is a certain step. And we just want to create more data, more than one uh, entity at the same time at the beginning of our test. So we can say, given the following users exist, and then we just provide a table with all the users. This might be like 20 users, maybe, if you want to check an overview. And just like line by line by line, just write them like this. Then the code will iterate over that, create all the users for you. And at the end of the test, they will clean it up again for you, so they will not exist anymore. So it's a really nice way of doing that. Then um, you can also add tags to these scenarios. Like, there are two tags here that are very important to us as Drupal um, uh, developers. So the first tag is the API tag. This will actually unlock a piece of code that will allow us to use the Drupal API in our tests. And we will need this for creating um, users and entities and stuff, logging in users. So when we say, given I am logged in as an administrator, what will actually happen behind the scenes is that the BHAT code will do a call to Drupal, and they will log in a user using the Drupal API. And there is another tag that we can add if we add a tag add JavaScript to the top of our uh, scenarios, and the, the test will actually run in a real browser using, uh, for example, software like Selenium or PhantomJS. So they will actually launch Firefox or Chrome or another browser and run the test in an actual browser. And this means that you can test your JavaScript functionality using BHAT. Uh, I'm not going to show how to set it up because uh, like Selenium is, can be a bit hard to set up on a system. But if you want to do this, I mean, you can find some blog post that explains how to set it up. And this tag will unlock it. It's best if you don't test JavaScript, because you don't put the tag, because running the test in a real browser makes it a lot slower to run. All right, now, BHAT has a whole bunch of steps. They call the steps of one line of test. It's called a step definition. They have a whole bunch of steps built in. So I have a few examples here. You can see the whole list. If you install BHAT and you type BHAT-DI, it's called step definition info. You get a whole list of them. There are more than 100 of them built in. And these are typical things that, that are offered. Given I am not logged in, I'm an anonymous user, or I'm logged in as a user with a certain name. Given I have a node of a certain uh, node type with a certain title. So this will actually create a node in the, in the website, and then you can test it. You can visit paths. 
You can click on links, you can enter data in fields, press buttons. You can check that some text is visible on the website, that some link is maybe not visible because the user doesn't have access. And yeah, there are more than 100 of these steps. So you can, with these steps, you can basically test 99% of all the functionality that you need without having to write a single line of custom code in your test suite. You can just install Behead, use this stuff, and get on with your job. Um, all these steps are organized in what Behead calls contexts. So we have like a Mink context. Mink is software which is uh, driving the browser. So it's like a translation layer between PHP and Selenium or PhantomJS or um, uh, Curl, because you can also consider Curl as a browser. So you get an HTML page from the website and parse it. We have a whole bunch of Drupal steps. Drush, you want to run Drush commands in your tests, it's possible. You can check messages. So um, if an error message appears on the screen or a success message. And then there is a final one which is called feature context. And this is intended for your own custom code. If you have custom steps that are specific to your project and not in the built-in ones, then you can put them in there. Some examples, main context will be interaction with the website because it's the browser driver, so it will be visiting paths, entering data and fields, pushing buttons and stuff like this. Drupal context will be very Drupal specific, given the following languages are available, given the cache has been cleared, you know, Drupal stuff. Drush will be running Drush commands. Message context should be, I should see a success message. And then feature context is um, your own custom stuff. Then there are also subcontexts. So if there is a subcontext is module specific, there might be a module, if you write a custom module for your client and you maybe want to reuse it later on in a different project, then you can add test step definitions which are very specific to this module. If you have a news module, you can say given I have the following news articles and then put the code in that subcontext. And one example that's out in, uh, on Drupal.org is OG Menu, for example, they have a subcontext and you can write them for your own modules. And an example of OG Menu, so OG Menu is for organic groups. So it will put information about groups in menus. So they will have a step that says, then the navigation menu of the classroom group should have three links. They have steps like this. So this is very module specific stuff. All right, to get started, I'll go really quickly over this. So in Drupal 8, you will need Composer. You need to Behat Drupal extension because this uh, provides the whole integration between uh, Drupal and Behat. And you will have to write a configuration file which is called behat.yaml. Um, Composer, you can install it from the website. I'm not going to go into this because you should know this already. <laughs> there are other sessions about this stuff. Installing the Behat Drupal extension is done using Composer. So you say Composer require Drupal slash Drupal extension. And once you've done that, there will be a command line application for you available. And this command line application is called Behat, and it will be in the vendor folder. This is familiar to everybody, I guess. Okay, and to see if it works, you can just run the command and type dash dash version, and then it will, if it works, everything is installed correctly, it will output the version of it. Um, you need to provide a behat.yaml uh, configuration file. Um, this is pretty long, but if you want to, it's documented, of course, in the readme of the project. So if you go to the Drupal extension project, you can see the full documentation there. Basically what you see, you list the context that you want to use. So you want to use the Drupal context, main, main context, and so on, some of your own. Then you see that the base URL is provided there because Behat will be able, need to be able to talk to your Drupal site. So you put your local host uh, base URL there. And then also the route to the Drupal installation should be there because Behat also needs to be able to talk to the API. Basically, those are the things you need to customize in that and everything else can be taken on from, um, from the basic one. And then you have a command to initialize a test suite. So you have Behat installed with Composer and you can type the command Behat dash dash in it. And this will generate scaffold a few files and folders for you. So you will have, uh, that will create a new uh, folder and the folder is called the features folder because a test in Behat is called a feature. We are testing features of the website. So they say, okay, our features are described here and it will generate an empty class for you, which is called a feature context class and they invite you to 
put your own custom code in there. It will be there, it has a, the right, uh, and, um, ex uh, the, the class is defined in there, it's empty, but you can start using that. And then you can just write a test, you can start doing it. So here is another example, uh, an anonymous user can see the news overview. So given the precondition is I have uh, two news articles, given I'm not logged in and I visit the news path, then I should see the heading news. And I should see the link article one, and I should see the text, the first article, so I basically check that my news works. And this is saved in the features folder, which was created by a behead init command in a file, and the file you give it whatever name you want, and it ends in dot .feature. So the extension of the test is always dot .feature. Okay? All right, and then you can run it. So it's written, you just type bhat, vendor bin bhat, it will scan the current directory, if it finds the features folder there, it will run all the tests, all of them. Of course, if you want to run a single one, you can pass it as a parameter, if, if you have like 20 tests written, maybe you only want to run one, and then hopefully it will say that everything passed. If something is wrong, then it will tell you, it's like, oh yeah, this step failed. And it has some really nice plugins as well, so you can take screenshots of the test running um, if something fails and like you see a screenshot that's written in your temporary folder so you can see actually what was wrong on the page. Okay, um, I'm almost finished with this. Um, some useful commands that you have in BHAT, you can do the DL, dash DL um, option to list all the definitions. If you want to be reminded of the the way the user scenarios are structured with, uh, they have like a really funny uh, div, uh, example test with, with just like from some James Bond stuff with spy uh, agencies and things. And also they have a command, if you want to write custom steps, then you can just write your behead test and say like, ah, given I have three news articles, and you can run the command behead with append snippets and it will actually create a little bit of code in your feature context and you just have to complete that. I'm, I'm not gonna show it, but um, you can look into that. It's like scaffolding a little bit of code and uh, that's quite nice. Okay, if you want to be, uh, try it out really quickly, I am maintaining a fork of the Drupal project. Uh, Drupal project is like a composer starter kit for Drupal 8 websites. And I made a fork of this which has BHAT built in. Not only BHAT, it is also supporting uh, the Drupal 8 test suites. And it has um, a PHP code sniffer in there for testing your coding standards. Uh, it has a good readme, so it explains everything. But basically, you can install, you can fork this project, register on Travis CI, enable the project on Travis CI, and you can push code and it will immediately start running. It's everything is pre-configured there and you can just write a test and try it out and you will see like two minutes later, you will see test results. So if you want to look into how continuous integration can work for you, I invite you to have a look at this. And then finally, um, you will be very curious to see some real example codes of BHAT tests because I just gave a small introduction of this. Um, actually, the BHAT Drupal extension itself has, is tested in BHAT. So if you install BHAT Drupal extension and look into their features folder, you will find a whole bunch of tests there. And also, this is a project that I'm, uh, um, I've been working on with a team at the European Commission for the last two years. We have tested our entire functionality in BHAT. So if you go, if, you, if you're curious about like what can be done, and what, how do these tests, maybe I'll, I'll, if I have a minute left, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through that. So the, the project is called JoinUp and it's on GitHub. So EC Europa is European Commission. Europa, I don't think the EC uh, namespace was free probably. So we have a test folder and in there you will find hundreds of BIA tests and also the custom implementations. Okay, uh, I actually have five minutes. Uh, are there any questions, or can I show you some example code, maybe, would be a question? Okay, so, you're running a VHAT test, and something, so the test says that something goes wrong. Yes? 
Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so the question was, how do you debug behead tests? So in behead, you can add a line. You can actually add breakpoints in your test by typing, then I break. And what will happen, the test will run up to that point, and then in the terminal, it will tell you, please press enter to continue. So the test will stop at that point, and you can actually look at the website, because, I mean, it's testing the real website, and go to your news page and look at what's there. So if you want to figure it out more in detail, you can put multiple breakpoints, of course. And there is also a plugin for Behat, which is called um, uh, Behat Step-by-Step Step or something. It actually requires you to press space every time for every single line that gets executed, so you can really look at it running. And then if you add a JavaScript tag, you can see it running in a browser. So if you have Selenium running, you see Firefox, and it runs a test, and normally it will go really quickly. But of course, if you set the breakpoints and you can see the test running and see exactly where it goes wrong. So that's really helpful to do that. Okay, another question? Yes? Yeah, there, you should not install test code on the production environment. It's, it's not intended to run on a production environment, so there might be security vulnerabilities in it. It's like, I suggest that you install it as a dev dependency in Composer. So if you say Composer install dash dash dev, then it will be a dev dependency, and then if you create a build for the production, then it will not be part of it. It will simply not be there, and then there is no, no... I don't think there are any known vulnerabilities in it, but, I mean, this is pure development code. You should not have it on production. Keep it light. Yeah. Okay, question? I had some discussions with people here that are trying to do stuff like this. Uh, it's not like uh, fully hashed out yet, but there is there are, like they were doing things like given I have this APK package installed on my mobile device, which then allows you to push elements with like simulating fingers, but it's not intended for uh, visual regression testing. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you have shown some slide that uh, uh, showing uh, the. Uh, the commands of Miat, no? Yeah. And there were some placeholders, and they seems to be very human uh, understandable. How yes. is he able to understand, I mean, the field, is it the field, the machine name, or, or whatever? I mean, uh, w what kind of values should be put? Uh, yep. uh, it depends on the context. Uh, is it working? It's, oh. They built it really um, in a really friendly way. It's, I mean, Beard is really intended for you to write tests quickly. So what it will do, it will first check if a field exists with this, the label name that you typed in there. If it doesn't find a label with this human readable title, then it will look at the, the name or the title tag of the field. If that's not there, then it will look if, if maybe there is a field with the ID that you gave. So it, it actually checks multiple points, and it will probably find a field for you. And um, also because we're integrating with Drupal, we know that, okay, we use this label for tag in HTML, and then it points to the actual ID of the field. So it, it works really transparently. Yeah. Yep, it will find it. Okay, any other questions? I think our time is up, so we have one minute. Yeah. Okay, I won't have time to show anything then. But anyway, feel free. Uh, um, uh, yeah. If there are any questions left and you see me in the hallway tomorrow, then feel free to talk to me. Thanks for the attention.